to be Romanian. Uh, two of the four million Romanians living outside the borders of Romania, 20% of the population of the country, partly the result of a very successful post-communist transition. I'm more rock than star. <laughs> uh, our first speaker on this panel is uh, Rajiv Narayan, who is um, the, the principal researcher at Amnesty International, covering the two Koreas, Japan and Mongolia. Uh, he's based in London. Uh, he was a uh, Korea Foundation Distinguished Visiting Fellow. He was a visiting professor at Yonsei University in South Korea. Uh, he has uh, led research and drafting of several uh, Amnesty International reports on North Korea relating to the political prison camps, human rights, and the food crisis affecting uh, North Korea. Um, of course, uh, last but not least, Rajiv and Amnesty International have been very active in efforts aiming to uh, pass, to persuade the UN Security Council to pass the resolution on March the 21st of this year, establishing a commission of inquiry on North Korean human rights. He uh, holds a doctorate from the University of London. I, I have to say that about 20 years ago, we went to school together in South Korea. And when those files uh, are open, both of us will likely be illustrated. But until that day, we are ready to listen to his presentation. But the floor is yours. Thanks, Greg. I think we are paying the price of not exactly studying, <laughs> but enjoying <laughs> in Seoul. Um, I shall pass that and uh, focus more on uh, this session, which is on uh, dealing with uh, human rights in North Korea. Um, I'd like to believe, actually, the position I hold that Amnesty is as a researcher on uh, South Korea, Japan, Mongolia, and North Korea. And actually, interestingly, uh, and increasing a bit on China as well. And most of the North Korea, in, you know, North Korea is a common factor. When I look at North Korea, you know, there are North Koreans in China, there are North Koreans in transit in Mongolia, North Koreans in Japan, and North Koreans in South Korea. And um, Again, in Amnesty, we are a membership-based organization. We have uh, thousands of members in South Korea and in Japan and hundreds of members in Mongolia. But uh, I'd be very surprised to hear if we have any members in uh, North Korea. Mm -hmm. And again, uh, if we are, if there are, I would be also very concerned about their uh, uh, conditions. Um, <coughs> today also is a very interesting day because, I mean, we always think very timely. But it also happens that today is the day when Amnesty launches its, has launched its annual report, uh, which you know, highlights, gives a snapshot of uh, about 150 plus countries and the human rights situation. And uh, I'm basically the spokesperson on North Korea, South Korea, Japan, and Mongolia. And so, uh, uh, you know, very briefly, when we look back at North Korea, it's interesting when we I, I keep looking at the 10, 12 years I've been in Amnesty. And the issues are just the same. We still have concerns on the political prison camps. Arbitrary, arbitrary detention continues. There are thousands of people in these detention facilities. Um, there's no freedom of expression. And as, as I mentioned before, no freedom of association. Uh, no freedom, uh, no media freedom. Uh, the, again, freedom of movement is highly restricted, in, in, in fact, with the present, uh, the new government, Kim Jong Un's government, uh, or uh, regime, whichever way we'd like to call it, we hear of actually the number of uh, North Koreans reaching South Korea is actually reduced considerably, uh, raising concerns about uh, increased uh, security in the North South Korea, uh, sorry, the North Korea China border, um, and and and. <coughs> Also, when we look at uh, issues such as death penalty, we know that uh, many people continue to be executed. Uh, also, there are extrajudicial executions in the prison uh, or, arbitrary, or in the detention facilities in, in North Korea. Um, and all this comes within a context of a long-standing food crisis, and, uh, which, has, which continues to be rampant, and the millions who are still um, are you know, suffering the consequences of the food crisis, and North Korea essentially remains dependent on aid from the World Food Program and many other international agencies. Um, coming back to uh, what Greg raised very briefly, um, yes, we have been working for the last uh, year, year and a half, 
uh, lobbying from the civil society side with countries in the United Nations, especially with Japan, the EU, uh, United States, uh, among other countries, to uh, you know to establish for the UN to establish a uh, commission of inquiry, and uh, which uh, was passed by a resolution without a vote in uh, March this year. And as you know, uh, as has been mentioned, there, there are three very distinguished uh, members now who have been appointed uh, recently. Uh, actually, the, resolu the same resolution defines the mandate of this uh, proposed commission of inquiry to, I quote, investigate systematic widespread grave violations of human rights in the DPRK. And then it defines it further to include, and this is, this gives the wide array of human rights violations in North Korea. This is the violation of the right to food, the violations associated with prison camps, torture and inhuman treatment, arbitrary detention, discrimination, violations of freedom of expression, violations of the right to life, violations of the freedom of movement and enforced disappearances, including the form of abductions in, uh, of nationals of other countries. And so and they're all interlinked, and that's what is of concern. And for Amnesty International and the 40 other NGOs who were part of the International Coalition to Stop Crimes Against Humanity in uh, North Korea, uh, known as ICNK, uh, we, for, this, for us it does amount to crimes against humanity. And we do also know that the mandate for the Commission of Inquiry is very difficult. They have to report in nine months. Uh, by, this, uh, by March next year, they have to uh, submit a report. We also know that uh, I think last week the Marines officially uh, rejected the Commission of Inquiry, saying that it's an intrusion. And they will, so the little tiny bit of hope that there was for some level of access is also being denied. So which means that they are going to deal with, uh, you know, it, it, it's a very difficult uh, situation. How do they research? How do they document these crimes, these human rights violations? How are they going to bring it to the point where they can say these are crimes against humanity? These need to be investigated. Anyway, this is something which people like Greg, uh, Dr. Yoon and others have been, and us, we've been dealing with for a long time. Uh, and. The, 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 the fact is that over time, and in part because of the food crisis in North Korea, uh, there have been uh, there have been increased number of North Koreans who have come out of North Korea into China, and then they've spread out into different countries, especially into South Korea. And we have amongst us, for instance, Shin Dong Hyuk, who is a remarkable story to uh, tell, uh, and I'm looking forward to that in the next session. Uh, there's also uh, thousands of uh, North Koreans, not just in, 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 in uh, South Korea, but also in Japan, hundreds in uh, European countries, a few in the United States and other countries. Um, <clears throat> and of course, there are many thousands in China, but their situation is very, very uh, vulnerable. They, can be, uh, forcibly, they are forcibly returned in the thousands every year. Uh, and then they bear the face, uh, again, great risk to their lives. Many are tortured, ill treated, detained um, in conditions which are appalling. And many of them die due to lack of food or forced labor. Um, and um, some of them do, uh, quite a few of them get released and then try to get back to, to China, uh, to leave the country. Uh, but they are a, a very, very important source of information for us because we are denied entry into North Korea. Uh, the other source of information, for instance, are journalists who are able to go to China or North Korea border. Some of them do also go to uh, North Korea, again, very monitored visits. Uh, there are also organizations who help the North Koreans in uh, China, and there are also people who tell us information. Some of them are humanitarian aid organizations. Uh, a few, another important source of information for us is, are the uh, humanitarian agencies in North Korea. Uh, for instance, World Food Program, uh, who have been feeding two, three million uh, North Koreans every year. Uh, the World Health Organization, the uh, UNICEF, among others. And they have periodic reports which they uh, collect with surveys from, with cooperation from the North Korean authorities. Um, so there is information available, uh, but again, it's not perfect. It's information which comes with a lag of time. 
and or it's with people who are outside the country, many of whom are scared because their relatives are still in North Korea, who face guilt by association, they could disappear, and so uh, they do not reveal all the information we need. And again, we only get testimonies, so it's, it's something which they are telling us of, something they've seen a while ago. And again, there is a, uh, it's, it's difficult to specify exactly when these take place. Um, from Amnesty's side, uh, it's also been for this. Uh, I was looking back, and actually I have to go back to the 1970s, when we, uh, my predecessors, actually, we, we published a report, a fascinating testimony of a Venezuelan poet called Ali Lamada, who had the misfortune of uh, being an inmate of one of the prison camps in Saragon. <laughs> Uh, between 1968 and 74, and where you know he highlights uh, the poor prison conditions, the lack of an independent judicial process, the severe punishment meted out to even foreign nationals who express criticism to the leadership uh, that would have been accepted as ordinary criticism in most other countries. According to Ali Lamed and I cite, in, uh, during my third year of my imprisonment, the food rations, meager as it was, was suddenly decreased, and in addition the work targets for the prisoners were raised. This sort of treatment reduced grown men to weeping over the food they were given. And what's sad is that Ali Lamadea's experiences echo the human rights violations faced by prisoners even today, uh, and they are in the thousands. By the mid-90s, uh, Amnesty was expressing concern on the plight of North Koreans abroad, such as those faced by North Korean workers in logging camps in uh, Russia, in the Russian Federation and concerns on human rights violations subjected to these uh, to those individuals who fled these logging camps because the condition the labor conditions were very very uh, very very bad and many some of them were caught and then forcibly returned to north korea and quite a few of them were executed in 2000 uh, we issued a report that expressed concern on the vulnerability of north korean refugees who had crossed the border to china in search of food so then the food factor comes up and so by 2004, we published a report on the human rights impact, uh, the, uh, the, the, the indivisibility of human rights violations as a consequence of the food crisis, what the North Koreans call the arduous march. Uh, the, this, and this work was followed by another report we did on the crumbling health sector in North Korea, and the plight of a drastic lack of access to basic health facilities to millions of ordinary North Koreans, whose health was already severely affected by the uh, you know, long-standing uh, food crisis. Um, and since then, because of increased access to testimonies, uh, because of increased numbers of North Korean survivors of political prison camps, uh, technology, uh, access to satellite technology, uh, focusing on these prison camps, uh, reports of increased domestic criticism following the government's failure to resolve the food crisis, and then also the present transition from Kim Jong-il to Kim Jong-un. Uh, there were concerns that there would be an increase in the population of uh, those sent to political prison camps. And so Amnesty refocused attention. We went back to uh, the conditions of uh, political prison camps, especially that of uh, prison camp, uh, political prison camp 15 at Yodok. Um, and we uh, conducted a campaign calling for the North Korean government to acknowledge the existence of these political prison camps and that they closed them. The interesting thing is that the North Korean government says these camps don't exist at all. And so we have to use, again, as we do not have access, so we then have to uh, use satellite technology, we have to use testimonies, and then try to, so it's kind of from above the ground and from below, and try to get, and the sad part again is that most 90%, more than 90% of these uh, survivors are from this political prison camp, uh, 15. Um, and again, uh, we highlighted the practice of guilt by association, uh, what's known in Korean as the Yeon Chukache system. And so one of the cases we highlighted was that of Shin Suk Chia. And this was a case we took up in the early 90s. Uh, and this was Shin Suk Chia and her two daughters who were known to have been detained in political prison camp 15 at Yitok. Um And this was uh, because her husband, uh, Ogil Lam, uh, who had the chance to go to Europe, defected and then they were uh, detained and last they were known to be at Yodok. And this query was then uh, forwarded by the UN uh, working uh, group on uh, arbitrary, arbitrary detention to the North Korean authorities. 
And last year in April, uh, the North Koreans informed that Shinsuja had died of complications to uh, link to hepatitis. They also claimed that her doctors did not want to uh, meet their father, have any contact with their father, who is now based in uh, South Korea. Uh, it is, however, there are more questions because of that. It's not clear where she died, when she died, was she in a political prison camp at Yodak. The fated whereabouts of her two daughters also remain unknown. Um, so, uh, I have only two more minutes. So, um, Oh, one. Okay. So, <laughs> I can go on and on, but I'll quickly curtail. So, uh, coming back, so the challenges, uh, the, you know, uh, the, these unique challenges of investigating human rights violations in North Korea uh, for the Commission of Inquiry uh, uh, remains, especially given the remit, which is to investigate these systematic, grave, widespread human rights violations with a view to ensuring full accountability in particular, where these violations would amount to crimes against humanity. So, again, as I mentioned, they have a limited time frame. We hope they may be extended. Uh, they have a limited uh, resource. Uh, and also, they, will, they are not going to get access into the country, even if they get access. It will be very monitored, so it will be you know, uh, quite risky for them to document uh, freely. Um, and also, so it, it is uh, our responsibility, the international community, civil society groups, countries who are supporting to give them as much information as possible. But then there are questions, and I'll end with that, which is what will uh, be the step beyond the Commission of Inquiry? Will the Commission of Inquiry need, uh, you know, will it name individuals? And if so, will these individuals ever be tried? And will it start a process that could lead to transitional justice, which conveniently is the <coughs> of this, uh, conference, and I shall leave it there. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Narayan. Our next speaker is Dr. Yoon Yeo Sun, who represents the North Korean Human Rights Archives at NKDB, the Database Center for North Korean Human Rights, an extraordinarily interesting organization that does great work. They've interviewed more than 13,000 North Korean defectors, former North Koreans in South Korea, producing extraordinarily valuable information for the international community, those groups dealing with North Korean human rights. Um, he uh, has been widely published, has been a visiting scholar at uh, Johns Hopkins University, has taught at uh, Yongnam Sogon and uh, Iwa Women's University in South Korea, and he's also a teaching professor at the Settlement Support Center for North Korean Refugees, known by many simply as the Hanawon. He has been awarded the Medal of Service from the World League for Freedom and Democracy for his achievement and devotion. Dr. Yoon, the floor is yours. Thank you. I'll use the PowerPoint. Good afternoon. I'll be giving a presentation on, on North Korea human rights of today, regarding its future and the RIP. The data on this presentation was extracted from our 2012 white paper on North Korean human rights, published by NKDB, short for Database Center for North Korean Human Rights. The presentation will be given as shown in the table of contents. As the chief director of NKDB, I'll first give a brief introduction about our database. Established in 2003, NKDB focuses its efforts towards the development of North Korean human rights, as well as the settlement of past human rights violations. The following are some of the main objectives and activities of NKDB. Some of the roles include collecting and analyzing data on human rights violations protecting and assisting victims, as well as operating North Korean human rights archives. In 2007, NKDB development of the NKDB's unified human rights database and is currently utilized it to systematically record and maintain information related to North Korean human rights issues and people. 
as of April 2013, the defendant's witness that has been interviewed is about 50% of the total defectors in South Korea. NKDB has analyzed 8,703 interviews into its database. However, due to lack of manpower, there are some data not yet analyzed. NKDB continues to collect data, including interviews, surveys, biographies, photographs, and film, instruments of torture, and more. This is the format of the analysis of incidents and people. As you can see, that it has over 200 question categories. We will now move on to the outline of 2012 White Bank on North Korea Female Rights. Since 2007, NKDB is annually publishing the white paper in, of English and Korean version. The conference for the Korean version is held annually in Seoul. The conference for English version was hosted by HRNK and the size is held every November in Washington, D.C. The main sources we gather regarding North Korean human rights are interviews and surveys, biographies, internet, photographs and films, and instruments of torture. As of July 31st, 2012, the total number of cases is over 42,000 <coughs> and has data of around 23,000 individuals. As you can see, personal mm, integrity and the right to revoke have the, the highest occurrence rate of 61.4%, followed by right to move abroad and the choice of residence by 12.8%, and right to life at 10.5%. As I mentioned, the total number of individuals analyzed by NKDB is around 23,000. The reason why the majority of individuals are victims is because the interviewees were determined mainly on the basis of individuals who were violated of their human rights. These slides show the graphs of the basic uh, form of information and informants. The highest source of, uh, source of information was given by interviews consisting of a high rate of 91.2%. As you can see in this picture, among the in, in permanent, the percentage for the accuracy of names, unit rates of information and gender are as shown in the diagram. Names, information, information, unit rate of information, gender. Next is a graph uh, showing the numbers of occurrences according to time. The analysis shows that the 2000 has the higher risk in 60 points of the total.
we will now move on to the number of occurrences according to certain areas of North Korea. As you can see, more incidents have occurred in areas bordering China. China. But fewer incidents have occurred in areas bordering South Korea. South Korea area. This is a graph showing the number of cases depending on the places of occurrence. This is the explanation of the data from the slide before. 51.0% of human rights violations in North Korea occurred in investigation or detention facilities and imprisonment facilities. According to the analysis in NKDB's Unified Human Rights Database of the causes of all human rights infringement cases, the rate of national border control crimes is the highest. The fact that national border control crimes account for the highest percentage of North Korean human rights violations shows how intensively North Korea is focusing on national border crimes. The North Korean government regards the inflow of outside information and the outflow of domestic information as the greatest threat to its security and so penalizes such actions as crimes against the system and people of North Korea. <coughs> now we will move on to our third section of the presentation. Well, I will talk about the evaluation of North Korean human rights. The fact that there are less North Korean human rights violations reports in Recent years can be interpreted in the positive manner that North Korea human rights is improving. This is the competitive analysis of human rights realities of the 1990s and the 2000s. This diagram shows decreased rate of occurrence since the 2000s compared from that of the 1990s. Then, this graph shows the increased rate of occurrence during the same time period. Such results show that the severity and the frequency of violations of the right to live the light of health and the light of education, and so on are relatively higher during the 1990s compared to the 2000s. Also, it showed that violations of such types of human rights has either worsened or improved during the 2000s. However, the fact that cases concerning the right of suspect and the detainees, the right to move and the Design and such are continuously increasing reflect the fact that North Korea's civil and political rights are still being severely infringed upon. I would now like to discuss the outlooks for North Korean human rights. To begin with, I would like to talk about the investigatory categories of Commission of Empire, shall I? The North Korean human rights included in the 2012 white paper. The data and information of NKDB will be an important asset to the CY. There are nine categories of the CY investigation. Out of the 42,000 cases that NKDB possesses, 38,000 can be classified under them, totaling up to 90% of the CY categories. <clears throat> the 
The following data are the nine CY categories and the number of cases based on NKDB. The abyss of human rights in North Korea is one of the most severe ones in today's society. At this moment, there are people suffering in all areas of North Korea. The North Korea regime should be the protect for human rights of its citizens. However, it is neglected due to the fact that the protect is actually taking the role of the neglect shows that alleviation in human rights at North Korea is difficult when left alone. Intervention from outside the state is essential to solve this paradox. And I dare say that we should be these outsiders for North Korean human rights. Thank you. Dr. Yoon, thank you very much. I have been asked to respect the order uh, in the agenda, so next I would like to invite me to give my presentation. Uh, I represent uh, the Committee for Human Rights in North Korea. Our co-chair, Ambassador Andrew Natsios, former USA Administrator, was a presenter on the first panel. Dr. Roberta Cohen was here um, for the first panel as well. She's the other co-chair of our organization. Uh, for the past uh, 12 years, we have produced a series of 16 reports addressing North Korea's main human rights violations from North Korea's hidden gulag to North Korea's Songbun, their social classification system. Um, we have been following very closely developments um, under the new regime of Kim Jong-un, and we have identified basically three ongoing trends based on a joint project we are running with Digital Globe, a global provider of satellite imagery, and based on interviews with former North Koreans. Josh Stanton is in the audience. Thank you very much for your help with the satellite project. Um, basically, uh, it appears that the North Korean hidden gulag, the political prison camp system, is undergoing a transformation. Facilities such as Camp Number 25 in Tongjin, North Hamgyong province, this Camp 25 has increased in size twice. From 2009 to 2010, the area of Camp 25 uh, increased from about half a million square, uh, square meters to about one million square meters. The camp used to hold about 5,000 prisoners of the 150 to 200,000. Um, in the meantime, um, it appears that other camps, such as Camp 22 in uh, Heryong, close to the border with China, North Hamgyong province, is undergoing a transformation that may involve the downsizing of that camp, or possibly the complete closure of the camp and the replacement of the slave labor force with um, villagers, uh, coal miners, and uh, farmers from the adjacent villages. Uh, we um, thought that there might be three reasons for this uh, apparent transformation of the North Korean Gulag. One of them, obviously, is that some facilities are too close to the border with China. As our friend Shin Dong-hyok told us a few months ago, one reason that he could think about is that if one prisoner manages to escape from Camp 22, it would be easier for him or her to find his or her way across the border into China. The other reason might be that there is a lot of Chinese activity. Ambassador Natios has mentioned the increased uh, economic cooperation between China and the DPRK. There are Chinese tourists in the area. There are some Chinese businesses. It may good, uh, make good business sense for the North Koreans to move these facilities away from the border. The second reason is um, an intensified crackdown on attempted defections. Uh, the number of uh, North Koreans attempting to cross the border declined dramatically from uh, 2011 to 2012, from over 2,700 to uh, just over 1,500 uh, defectors arriving in South Korea in 2012. More surveillance cameras have been installed on the Chinese side, and more surveillance cameras have been installed on the North Korean side. More people are getting arrested. If they have come across South Koreans or Christian missionaries during the road of defection, they're in very serious trouble. Uh, they might end up in the political prison camps together with members of their family, based on that system that Rajiv mentioned earlier, a system of guilt by association, up to three generations of the same family. Also, the cost of defection has increased. There are more surveillance cameras now. 
Uh, the brokers have to grease more palms in the process, so bribery goes up the chain of command. A third reason that uh, we can think about is the purge, the very aggressive purge that the North Koreans have been conducting since early 2009. That's when they began proceeding with the second hereditary transmission of power and um, basically the consolidation of uh, Kim Jong-un um, as the future leader of North Korea. And uh, many have fallen victim to this transition. Even the deputy director of the state security department, Ryu Gyeong, was executed. Then Udon Tik, first deputy director, dropped out of sight in March 2012. Many of us remember the badly botched currency reform of late 2009. Park Nam-gi, director of uh, finance and planning within the Central Committee of the Korean Workers' Party, was blamed, he was the scapegoat, and he was subsequently executed. Finally, uh, in uh, many of us remember, in July of last year, Kim Jong-un, Kim Jong-un's regime, purged the Vice Marshal Ri Yong-ho, one of the eight men walking by the hearse at Kim Jong-il at the funeral, who also happened to be Kim Jong-il's mentor. Uh, Kim, Jong-il, uh, Kim Jong-un served as a commissioned artillery officer under the command of uh, Vice Marshal Ri Yong-ho, he had absolutely no qualms about purging him, uh, demoting him on a Sunday, and this is reckless even by North Korean standards, the following day on Monday, Kim Jong-un made himself a marshal of the republic. So if officials get purged, then it's not only those respective officials, but the entire bureaucratic support structure underneath gets purged. This is a big bureaucracy, remember, and also members of the families of those officials who are purged. Um, as human rights uh, practitioners, experts following the North Korean human rights occasion, we understand that the scale of North Korea's ongoing human rights violations is astounding. Of course, one example that comes to mind is that of Romania, the one Eastern European country that was closest to North Korea as a dictatorial regime, a very bleak, oppressive country. Population of 23 million in 1989 when communism failed, the population of Korea is now about 24 million. Uh, according to the Institute for the Investigation of Communist Crimes in Romania, and Professor Stan has worked on this, over 3 million political prisoners suffered in Romania's 44 political prisons and 72 forced labor camps. More than 800,000 died in detention. However, in 1964-65, the Romanian political prison camp system was shut down. Of course, people continue to be under strict surveillance. Those uh, perceived as members of the, the wavering class, if I were to use a North Korean term, but that happened even before the Ceausescu regime that fell uh, 25 years later. In North Korea, there are still between 150 and 200,000 political prisoners in the camps. Romania's notorious secret police, the Securitate, which was mentioned by Ambassador Natsios, Professor Stan, and, uh, and other distinguished speakers today, uh, the Romanian Securitate had 11,000 agents and half a million informers. North Korea's vast network of coercion control, surveillance, and punishment runs much broader and deeper, and reconciliation with the brutal past is going to be significantly more challenging than it was in Romania or other Eastern European countries. Uh, North Korea's SSD, State Security Department, Kukka Anjon Boibu, uh, has a personnel of around 50,000 people. Uh, the Imin Boambu, North Korea's Ministry of People's Security, maintains about 210,000 personnel at the national, provincial, county, district, city, and village levels. Uh, with about 10,000 personnel, North Korea's Military Security Command, the Poi Sayonbu, the MSC, that institution alone is comparable in size to the Romanian Securitate. All North Korean citizens are required to be part of a neighborhood watch unit, an Imin Ban. 20 to 40 families belong to these units. They are supposed to report on neighbors and family members. The leader of the Imin Ban is chosen by the local committee of the Workers' Party. The leader receives pay and benefits from the, uh, the North Korean government and reports regularly both to the SSD and the MDS. Now, naturally, beyond uh, North Korea's appalling human rights situation, of course, it would be challenging. Um, the speakers, today's speakers will write, certainly a serious discussion of transitional justice probably makes sense 
only under a scenario defined by the reunification of the two Koreas under the auspices of the Republic of Korea, South Korea, and this is the title of today's conference, very appropriately so. Uh, in the initial stages, there would be this tension between uh, the quest for justice and um, the search for peace. Uh, this, if, the, if North Korea collapses, uh, this would turn out to be um, probably the largest humanitarian assistance operation in history. It would require the militaries of all concerned countries to intervene. It would require the military of North Korea to cooperate. So, so presumably some amnesty would be involved in the process that might have an impact later on the whole transitional justice process. Our own information, we mentioned between 150 and 200,000 prisoners in the camps. Well, actually this information comes from former officials of North Korean intelligence agencies. Some of them would be extraordinarily helpful and useful in the early stages of the transition in order to secure this much needed information. Now today we have mentioned um, the, uh, the importance of avoiding victor's justice. That South and North here were mentioned is not necessarily a very fortunate example as, uh, as a transition to a reunified country. In order to avoid this impression of victor's justice, the best way to approach it is to have North Koreans themselves in charge of this process. And that is why one type of action that we can take right now is to train and educate especially young North Koreans who are interested and concerned about the transition and about transitional justice in a unified Korea. We can teach them about international human rights standards, we can teach them about running NGOs, we can teach them about administering transitional justice. The number is very small. We need to cultivate them very carefully. There are only 25,000 former North Koreans in South Korea. The population of uh, North Korea is 24 million. By comparison, there are 10 million Cubans in Cuba and 1 million Cubans in Miami and around the Miami area. So the, numbers continues, the number continues to be slow, uh, low. Of course, one great challenge is the apparent lack of interest in North Korea and North Korean human rights in South Korea. Every time we travel to South Korea, we are reminded why that is the case. South Koreans have lived with this clear and present danger for more than 60 years. It is impossible to wake up every morning worrying about North Korea. Uh, so it's in a way a self-defense mechanism that enables people to maintain their own sanity. Uh, additionally, um, South Korea is a very competitive society. There is very little time, very little leisure to worry about other issues. Um, but, uh, but nevertheless, nevertheless, South Koreans themselves need to be better prepared. They need to be educated, and our friends in South Korea are very good at, for example, behavior change campaigns, information campaigns. This can be done, so both informing the South Korean public on the importance of understanding North Korean human rights, the importance of an adequate transition and transnational justice, and informing the very few dedicated North Koreans living outside the borders of North Korea on their possible role in a transition. Then comes the issue of the cost of Korean reunification. Uh, the cost of Korean reunification is going to be significant. In January 2013, the South Korean Minister of Strategy and Finance issued a report stating that if the two Koreas unify within the next eight years, the cost to South Korea will be up to 7% of its annual gross domestic product. Uh, every year, which would be about 80.62 billion out of 1.15 trillion dollars. The cost of prosecution, detention, uh, is certainly high. Now we have to remember that the DPRK would be gone. Former prisoners would not be suing the government of the DPRK or the Kim regime. The one entity responsible for these citizens of the Republic of Korea would be the government of the Republic of Korea. The same holds true of compensation claims, the same holds, to, uh, holds true of property restitution, for example. And there are, for example, so many South Koreans who still have property in North Korea. And yes, we do know that our friends in Korea do care a lot about land and property rights. Now, this might just open a new Pandora's box. We all remember the 1965 Friendship Treaty between South Korea and Japan. Now, pursuant to that treaty, compensation for the victims of the Japanese occupation period was provided to the South Korean government. As indicated by documents declassified in 2005, it was actually the South Korean government that decided to receive 
the compensation on behalf of the victims, former sex slaves, former forced laborers. Uh, this is still a very uh, <coughs> controversial issue in South Korea. Now, the jury, North Koreans were included in this deal as citizens of the Republic of Korea, according to the Constitution of the Republic of Korea. De facto, they were cut out of this deal. Under a, a process of transitional justice, it's likely that these claims will, will come up, and these will tr this could trigger a domino effect, a wave of claims involving other disenfranchised victims who uh, might be living in, uh, in South Korea at the time. Um, there would certainly be uh, multiple, multiple challenges. There are some uh, simple, disarmingly simple and frightening questions. How do we go about it? How do we merge the leadership of the two uh, Korean uh, militaries, the South Koreans and the North Koreans? What is to be done about it? Well, we can learn from precedent. We can learn from the very positive precedent uh, of, uh, of Eastern Europe and the former Soviet Union. Um, the Pentagon here and others have very good experience dealing with the decommissioning of Eastern European officers and NCOs who are retrained and prepared for civilian life. We have also learned our lesson in Iraq, where not dealing with these issues on time turned out to be a big mess. Um, certainly, we know that our friends in Korea know their history and care about their history. And we also know that there has been a truth and reconciliation process that was at times uh, deemed to be inadequate. It addressed the Japanese occupation period. It addressed the period of, um, of totalitarian um, uh, leadership in South Korea, but it did not address at all. North Korean human rights, and this is an issue that was raised at the time. Well, we know that history matters in Korea, and we know that success depends on the effectiveness of transitional justice, as mentioned by our speakers earlier today, using Eastern Europe as a precedent. But we also know that Korea's great advantage is that South Korea, the Republic of Korea, is a country where a rule of law truly exists, the Republic of Korea seems to be a country ruled by law. It's a country where rule of law reigns, and this might be a great advantage uh, for Koreans from the South and the North, as it was a great advantage for the citizens of the reunified Federal Republic of Germany. Once again, Koreans know their history, they care about their history. They had 1,000 years of history as one country, one people. Yes, 60 years, that's a long time. There are great differences, but I think that at the same time we need to remain optimistic and we should be, we, we have to be glad that we are asking these very hard questions at today's conference. That being said, I will thank me for my presentation <laughs> and uh, I'm going to, uh, uh, going to move on to Dr. Che Gu, who always asks me whenever I moderate his, uh, his panel not to make the introduction too long. That's obviously because we know him so well the director of the U.S. Korea Institute at the Johns Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies. He was also the director of the Human Rights in North Korea Project at Freedom House a few years ago. He has taught at Johns Hopkins, uh, SAIS, uh, Brown University, Yonsei University, has been widely published. He received his A.B. from Harvard University and um, M.S.C. from L.S.E. from the London School of Economics and his Ph.D. from the Johns Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies. Thank you for not heeding my <laughs> request, uh, and I want to thank everyone. The reception is just right outside because I'm not sure what else to add uh, to this very comprehensive uh, presentation on North Korea human rights. Um, perhaps because I've, I am one step removed from working on North Korea human rights every day, um, that. I can kind of take a look back and maybe uh, add some of my own comments from my own personal experience having worked on, on, on this issue. So maybe I'll uh, spend a little bit of time on, on, on the politics of the human rights community. Um, often I have young um, students coming to me because this is such a pressing issue and they want to get involved. And I encourage them, but, but once they get involved, they really should see this in the grander picture of what happens in politics, domestic, and both international relations. 
I also want to, uh, the second part I want to talk about is just a little, um, kind of um, add some comments on, on the abuses and, and the, the, uh, the processes of documentation. And then finally, really the third part that I really want to stress is, what is the world to do? So what should be the next step? Uh, when, come July uh, next month, when the Commission of Inquiry uh, uh, launches its commission and, and begins its work, um, I think it's important to know how we got there. Um, if you think North Korea's abuses are so widespread and so well known, and obviously this is this was the uh, 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 the approach, then that didn't that wasn't the way. Uh, it wasn't the way. And I think the single most important thing that uh, that has happened in the last decade uh, that all of us on the panel have, uh, have have talked about is is the the availability of information uh, that has come with with defectors, satellite imagery, and else. But this wasn't always the case. Um, when I joined Freedom House as its first and only human rights director on North Korea, despite Freedom House having labeled North Korea for the last 39 years as the worst of the worst regime, it was tough getting people to really grasp the, the gravity of the situation. In fact, there were probably more people on the other side denying the detractors, the supporters of, 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 of human rights abuses. In fact, when there were human rights conferences uh, at the UN organizations, it, there were more South Korean progressive NGOs that went there calling for that there were either no or no human rights abuses or there were you know, not enough information. And then when that argument was untenable, they turned to, well, what can we really do? We have more pressing concerns. We've got to resolve the nuclear issue. We've got to resolve the inter-Korean dialogue. And all of these other issues that are more pre pressing. And at the end of the day, it's an isolated country. It's, it's bad, we know, but what can we do? And really that kind of, that line of reasoning begs the question, what if it doesn't collapse? What if this regime continues 20 years, 30 years, 50 years, 100 years? What are the 150,000 to 200,000 who are in these gulags? Or the estimated 400,000 people who have, may have died uh, in, those, in those gulags? So, so, I, so I think we're on the right approach. I think in order to get compliance from North Korea, it's not going to be a dialogue. It's not going to be a request. It has to be some very forceful nature of, of the international standards. And I think we're on the right step. But it wasn't always like this. When one of the more proud moments uh, at Freedom House, um, the short time that I was there, I had commissioned two reports uh, that came out. Uh, David Hawke's uh, report on uh, crimes of, of concentration of inhuma uh, humanity, inhumanity and the Christian Solidarity Worldwide Report on, on, on North Korea um, um, uh, uh, call for basically laying out the groundwork, the legal groundwork to bring North Korea uh, to the United Nations uh, Security Council or to the Human Rights uh, International Organization. And when this happened this March, it wasn't so, you know, um, natural. I mean, there are things that happened in the last five, ten years that made this happen. Uh, one, there was a regime change, and I think that's important. There was a regime change in Washington. And I think with a new administration coming, this made it possible that the U.S. could take this approach and support it. Also, the aligning of the stars. It just happened that China, Russia, and Cuba were rotated off. I mean, how, how, I mean, that's, and that what, Venezuela was going to defend uh, North Korea? To small things like, it, it, is it a coincidence that the day the Assistant Secretary of State 
resigns is the day the U.S. says we we are we are on board. Maybe Ambassador has some, something to add later. <laughs> but again, uh, it, these are you know we don't work on human rights issues in the absence of politics. I remember m one of my first days at uh, Freedom House, you know, seeing a, a bumper sticker that said uh, "Regime change starts at home." Uh, and, and, and so it was difficult to get North Korea human rights issues to aggregate the interest in an administration that was considered kind of the world's abomination of human rights. I mean, so at the time, uh, the U.S. And so that really hurt, I think, the... the the, the inability of the human rights organizations uh, working on North Korea to go out and we, and we think about what is it that about North Korea that we can't seem to get some international spokesperson like Angelina Jolie or 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 have I mean have someone who can be recognized as the you know the moral or the intellectual or the the, the articulate person to do this and hopefully we have that uh, uh, person uh, personified uh, in, in in Mr. Shin Dong Yeo. Now, I think documentation of these abuses are extremely important. Uh, I think all of the panelists have have addressed that. Um, but it's not simply documentation. I think this documentation <coughs> process has to be so rigorous that it can't be simply cataloging. While wow, that's a great first step, it's got to go beyond simply cataloging defectors and interviewing them. I'm not a lawyer, but I think this movement would benefit from having those kinds of individuals who can see this, use their experience from other countries and cases to apply that kind of legal and academic rigor on, on the issues of, of North Korean human rights abuses. And I think the first place to start is with the Rome Statute. I mean, it lists, uh, Dr. Yoon in that um, uh, slide showed you know, various uh, crimes. And, and, and really, I think, the Roman statute lists 10 specific crimes, murder, extermination, enslavement, deportation, imprisonment of, uh, um, without physical liberty, torture, rape, uh, persecution of groups, um, enforced disappearance, crime of apartheid, maybe that one doesn't apply, but other inhumane acts uh, similar to causing great suffering. And the notion that this must be systematic, and we have to document that to be a systematic abuses. And, and what evidence do we have? We talked a lot about um, uh, the, 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 the evidence that exists. Um, when, when, when Greg was talking uh, about uh, the prison camps, I, I didn't get a pres uh, the slide presentation, but this is where Camp 22 is, uh, up in the north. Uh, and Camp 25, and I will have all these slides in my, my paper uh, eventually. But in terms of the, the, the list of crimes that uh, if um, shown to be widespread, systematic, um, these are the issues, uh, I think, crimes that we need to improve upon. I know that the um, Greg's organization uh, the Hidden Gulag, first and second edition, is a great, great step uh, towards that, where, where, where it's documented, where torture, rape, uh, withholding of food, arbitrary execution, forced labor, absence of due process, all of those things are, are documented. But I question whether we are doing this in absence of some overarching coordination. Uh, when the U.S. Commission of Interna International Religious religious freedom in, uh, you know, in one of their reports, interviews, is interviewee number 39 the same as the person who is in this report and another report? And I will address that in, in the third section. To talk about, we've talked about the gulags. We've talked about the inductions. And, and there are cases that really need to be addressed in person by name, 
because I think for those of you, especially young, those young students who are, who are interested, you've got to put a face with the number. Too often, 150,000, 200,000, 2 million dead, uh, it, it just, you kind of rattle off the names and, 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 and you don't realize that there are individuals and families tied to these individuals. Roger talked about Mr. Ogimau. Uh, he was, he's been to uh, our conferences on, on numerous occasions. He, um, you know, uh, we've arranged for him to go visit members of Congress. This is just not a, a figure, a number. This is a person who really misses his wife and two daughters who he hasn't seen in decades. Who, um, and he's you know, almost had given up hope. And so I think it's important to see these individuals. For example, the hijacking of the Korean airliner uh, in 1969. Of the 46 people, only 39 returned. Um, the captain, the first officer, flight attendant, a manager, a program director at NBC, a doctor. All these people have names. And these individuals need to be documented in such a way that I think in the future we can, if need be, to bring some closure and justice to the victims. And that's where I want to uh, talk about the third part of my discussion, what can the international bodies do? I think we can make more improvements on the documentation process. Um, we talked about defectors, interviews, uh, the journalists, uh, agencies. <clears throat> there has to be, I think, a government component here too. Beyond the, the traditional white paper on human rights. Uh, and that, I think, behooves us in the human rights community, in the uh, NGO world, to really press the governments, maybe through various um, tools like uh, uh, the Freedom of the Information Act. I mean, what are the governments talking to other governments who have, who have embassies there? What are they writing back uh, in, in these? I mean, what kind of, if any, information can we, can we um, uh, garner? And here I would propose that there needs to be an international repository for all documents related to North Korea human rights. A documentation, a documentation center, a data, database center. I know that Dr. Yun runs one in Seoul, but something that has kind of an umbrella structure uh, that has that has the capacity, um, both uh, uh, country-specific expertise, but also legal expertise, uh, to look at these. And perhaps we can put that in an academic setting, university. I was really thinking of law school. Uh, but I think the human rights, the North Korean human rights community could really benefit from having uh, something like this because it will be a constant reminder of the need to work on these issues and that you will actually have a center that has the capacity uh, to do this. Certainly, we've talked about the political approach to this, the bilateral, the multilateral approach. Uh, the linking of human rights issues with progress and security talks, uh, some modicum of linking with humanitarian assistance talks, and certainly the legal approach. If, and, and Rajiv talked about this as well as others, what is the next step? What, what recommendations would COI uh, put forth come next year? And then, then what? And I think it, it would help it, for those of us working on these issues in the human rights community to really think about what would be the potential scenarios of this and what is the next step? And why is this important? I think when unification, if or when it happens, this one, this needs to be addressed. There has to be closure for, for the victims. If you know about Korean politics, not just North but South, you have things that really cloud, I mean, even the South Koreans really are contesting their identity. Are you from the Southwest, Southeast? Who's, who's screwing whom in politics? And then you add another layer of that if you have unification with North Korea. 
And so some, some level, and we talked about it in the first panel, um, whether, whether it, do you put all of them in jail, none of them in jail? But something has to be done, and I think have the, the, the first real step is to have some kind of repository of information that can help guide this process. And I see my time is up, so I'll um, um, you know, uh, the rest of the comments uh, for, for Q&A. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Kuhn. to remind you to keep your questions brief, if possible, identify yourselves and uh, your affiliation, and also please do remember to uh, wait for the mic. I will abuse my privileges and ask Dr. Yoon san a quick question. Dr. Yoon, you mentioned that about 50% of North Korean defectors in South Korea have been interviewed. Is the number 13,000 or 23,000? I, I thought 23,000 was also included in the presentation. The actual total number. Uh, 2,000. 20,000, uh, 20, 50, 000 in South Korea. Uh, there are currently 25,000 North Korean defectors who have resettled in South Korea. No, but how many has NKD been interviewed? Uh, I know that number, but yes. 13,000. 13,000, great, thank you very much. Um, we'll go to, go to Peter Humphrey next. Um, are you guys maintain? are you guys maintaining a list of current and suspected prisoners and is that list being handed over to Amnesty International so that they can write letters and urgent action campaigns? Or is this a big, is there, did, did, did you drop the ball here somewhere? I'm sorry, I need to translate. ファレスバルセガニコピエサクエピエザドルチョサルハウイトカジュニアンチョチョウソヨンセイナサラムドイコキョアスウェイナサラムドイコタンピエザドイモディナンデクインボルドルチェギタソサルハウイチマンチョン
the resentment that might be caused by people who have left who are returning and then being put in charge of this kind of process. Another is the, um, the agenda that such individuals might have. I'm thinking, for example, of um, East Timor, now Timor-Leste, where the United Nations basically, without any election or referendum, turned over the government of the country um, to the people who had been in exile for 25 years in Portuguese colonies and who came back and did things like making Portuguese the national language of their country when less than 5% of the population or less than 3% spoke that language. They had their own agendas. Um, so um, uh, I'd just like to suggest that there be sort of further thinking about the implications um, of that kind of solution. Just one other quick point in regard to the database. Um, which is collecting information is extremely important. Organizing it is equally important. Uh, case matrix uh, is a very important tool for doing so. And um, there is an organization connected to the International Criminal Court that provides assistance to NGOs around the world in training them to use a case matrix system as a way of um, analyzing their data so that it can be properly used for documentation. The bigger your database, the more important it is that it be organized in this way. Otherwise, it just creates huge problems down the road when you're then looking at using it for accountability. Thank you, Professor Cohen. Any panel reactions? I will then go to uh, Chris Nelson. Uh, thanks very much, Greg. Chris Nelson, Nelson Report. Uh, another great discussion. Uh, I think Jacob's presentation really homes in on, the, on this critical dilemma. Um, we want the North Koreans to reform. Uh, ideally, we want them to reform themselves. Uh, uh, is that even remotely realistic? Uh, how would we set up a system of incentives externally that could be implemented uh, without enormous risk to the implementers? Uh, uh, we discussed earlier uh, you know, trying to assure everybody below the Kim family elite level, uh, don't worry, there's a life for you in North Korea uh, after they've gone. Mm, okay, but, and, how, you know, and then we decided, well, we couldn't really say that out loud, uh, you know, that level. Uh, but doesn't that end up just reinforcing in the Kim family levels? We'll fight to the last man, who cares? You know? uh, so it, I, I just hear the tremendous uh, conflict here. Uh, the more we find out, the more we need to feel we need to do, the more we, we build international pressure, uh, it all seems to come down to either s somehow persuading Kim himself to, to start a reform process, or simply saying the only thing that's going to work is the collapse of this regime with all of the, the problems that we've talked about earlier. Now. Oh, any <laughs> I think that question is too black and white. It's either or. And I think nothing in reality is that black and white. Already I'm hearing um, uh, by various individuals uh, to, for North Korea we need to coordinate where the human rights COI is going because if North Korea next day wants to talk to us, we can't let this be an obstacle. And I think that's bollocks. I think we should have every approach by by NGOs, international community, governments doing what they want to do or think is in their best interest at full speed. And I think it's only then when North Korea sees that it can determine what it wants to do. What North Korea does best is divide and conquer everyone else approaching them. And so already, if there are those people in Washington and elsewhere that says, we've got to limit the ability of the COI, then North Pyongyang has already won that first step. And so my, my and I don't know where that would go, but my view is that that COI, the human rights groups, um, 
do what they do best, regardless of what this um, will have implications for, for government officials. Government officials will do what they should do. And I think in that kind of chaotic, perhaps chaotic approach, uh, North Korea will see what it needs to do, whether it needs to negotiate or whether it needs to um, hunker down. And, and uh, But you know, I think pressure, pressuring them to make decisions. Uh, yes, sir. I'm Bert White. Um, I'm a private pro bono advocate, but I worked in the U.S. Congress and executive branch for the past 50 years. Uh, I wanted to follow up on the question of the COI and, and just add preliminarily that the height of the Cold War, the U.S. was both working to get arms control agreements with Russia and at the same time pursuing human rights in Russia in terms of Jackson Bannock. So I would go further than the last answer and say even with regard to U.S. officials and other international officials, we should press them that they can walk and chew gum at the same time and they don't have to soft pedal human rights because of the nuclear issue. But my question about the COI is that in light of the fact there have been a number of UN investigations and extensive reports on North Korea, including the report of the Special Rapporteur, and given that North Korea has cooperated with none of them, uh, how can we expect the COI to really, uh, although it can amass, as someone suggested, all the different data that exists in various places, to really advance the ball in terms of uh, exposing or pushing on North Korean human rights. I think I'll try to answer. It's, it's, can you hear me? Um, I think it's a, it's a valid point. It's something which is true that I think the Commission of Inquiry actually brings to uh, it's, a, it's an expression of the international community's concern. Um, but beyond that, I think with the special rapporteur, he had very little limited resources. Now we're going to have more people working. There's more commitment by the UN to work, and there is an expectation that this will continue with the UN and also bring greater spotlight to the human rights issue, which then it's up to us not just the COI, to take it forward. And so very long, bring it along with what you're right, not just security, but also human rights, need to be put on the table with no clear. I think that's, that's very good. But there's no clear answer otherwise. <coughs> Let me address your first part. Um, I was just talking to a bunch of uh, American uh, officers studying at National War College. Uh, they came to the U.S. Korea Institute to discuss many uh, um, North Korea related issues. And what I said was, and I say we very loosely, we have lost the manual in fighting a totalitarian state. Um, the Soviet Union, um, I may have been probably the last generation in college to study communism. <laughs> Uh, the excess of Stalinist state, because I don't know if we teach that in our IR or you know classes anymore. Uh, certainly, our institutional government memory is very, very short. In fact, I mean, it's it's become very frustrating uh, on at least on North Korea related issues, uh, where 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 working on a frontline state has has been um, reduced to making sure everyone gets their receipts back. Um, I, I may be talking in codes here, but, but it seems like we've lost the sight of the big picture in dealing with a closed state, um, a totalitarian state, a small totalitarian state. Um, you know, <coughs> colleagues tell me when they were opening up Eastern Europe, you know, they were kind of parachuting in with a bag full of money and, you know, working on NGOs, civil society, etc. 
Nowadays, you know, we penalize them for if you can't have a receipt matching up with how the money was used. I mean, I mean that's indicative of where we are in dealing with states like. So, so I I think that's where we are, and that's why our discussion with with North Korea uh, tends to get uh, 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 channeled into very specific uh, 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 paths. Thank you. We have a question in the front row. Thank you. Um, my name is Konstantin Gosla. I'm a historian at the Ruhr University of Bochum. Um, and my question goes as follows. So if you look at human rights interventions after the Second World War, success is rather the exception. But in most cases, you can find at least reactions, sometimes discursive reactions, like uh, France in the Algeria war, they tried to, to turn around the picture that the other ones are uh, mis uh, misusing human rights, or sometimes uh, uh, regimes are trying to adopt their methods of persecution. If you look at Belarus, so they're persecuting more subtle. But uh, North Korea seems to be a case where there is no reaction at all. So at least this uh, is my impression after having heard your uh, talks. So my question is, from where do you get uh, your hope that uh, there will be any reaction from your wonderful work uh, from the North Korean government? I think information is going through. Um, you know, um, I've got all kinds of anecdotal stories. Um, uh, you know, a colleague of mine um, getting stuck outside of Pyongyang, uh, being retrieved back by the regime, and his car breaks down, and, and while the two guys that were sent to get him back are rolling down the, uh, the tie of the, the, uh, the, uh, the, the tire that got a flat, he's sitting there in the car, and an old man's coming in on a bike, and you know, he strikes up a conversation. He's, a, he's, he's ethnic Korean, but he's a, a German professor. And, and the old man says, can, when you go to Washington, can you tell your president to invade us and free us like Iraq? <laughs> I'm not making this up. I mean, and this is a very progressive professor um, telling me this. Um, I was in Pyongyang in April, and I just took random pictures of people. And, you know, this is, of course, Pyongyang. It's the most privileged city. Um, you know, young people with cell phones. You know, million and a half, two million sets, very you know, close. But information is going through. My uh, very smart interpreter wanted to know what Mitt Romney is like. How do people like Mitt Romney? And so, so information is going through, and these kinds of of, of discussions. And where are you, RFA and VOA? Um, you know, it, it gets broadcast, and uh, and 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 I think. It might not be instantaneous, but um, but information nowadays goes through North Korea, and so that's one aspect of this glimmer of hope. Thank you. We'll take the question in the back, Jason Keller. Uh, yeah, Jason Keller, former intern at oh, former intern at HRNK, um, and uh, Greg, you mentioned the massive humanitarian crisis in the event of regime change, collapse, unification, whatever we, we want to call it, specifically with 150 to 200,000 uh, political prisoners. Um, you know, this is going to be a huge logistical undertaking. Um, and is there, is there, are there conversations going on at either the governmental level or an intergovernmental level, or a non-governmental level, I should say, um, about what we're going to do about this? I mean, we learned some hard lessons at the end of World War, World War II with the concentration camps, you know, medically, uh, refugee crisis-wise, logistically, transportation. Um, are there conversations going on at any level about this? As far as the political prison camps are concerned, our organizations and uh, some of my colleagues on the panel have been part of these conversations. We have had conferences, we have had meetings where we discuss possibly applicable past presidents, uh, beginning with uh, the dismantlement of, uh, of the Nazi concentration camps and the things that were done right and the many mistakes that were made in the process. So the best we can do is to build comparisons with, uh, with the Nazi extermination camps or the Soviet gulags, see what we can learn from historic precedent. But there are certain things that we can do right now. There has been an ongoing debate about humanitarian assistance, food assistance, nutritional assistance to North Korea, whatever you want to call it. 
Uh, private efforts have continued, but we all remember that bilateral uh, food aid from the United States ceased in 2008-2009, not because the United States decided to uh, interrupt that uh, food aid to North Korea, but because North Koreans refused to conduct a nutritional survey, asked the five NGOs to leave at the time. So uh, I think that the human rights community and the humanitarian assistance community can work together for example, to address the World Food Program and other food aid agencies and persuade them to pay more attention to this particular issue of the political prison camps. Uh, a lot of people need uh, nutritional assistance in North Korea, but of all people, it's most likely those 150 to 200,000 prisoners held at these political prison camps. And we know how dire the situation is from our good friend Shin Dong-hyuk, for example, was born and, and grew up uh, inside Camp 14, spent the first 23 years of his life there. So uh, we, we definitely need to do a better job talking to our colleagues who focus primarily on, uh, on humanitarian assistance and come up with a coordinated approach. Uh, Professor Stan, you had a question. I have a very specific question. Mm -hmm. One of your slides, mm -hmm. uh, one of your slides mentioned perpetrators, 840 perpetrators. Can you can you give a little bit more examples of what kind of perpetrators will come and disclose their activities to you? Yeah. Uh, 먼저 제가 몇 가지만 함께 설명을 드리겠습니다. 질문보다 먼저 답변을 드리려고 하는데 저희 NKDB는 2년 전부터 어, 자신의 정보를 공개해도 좋다고 응답한 정보를 모아서 2주에 한 번씩 가해자와 피해자와 모든 사건 정보가 포함된 북한 인권 사건 리포트를 전 세계 2천여 명 MST와 UNHCR 미 국무부, 우리 관계되는 2천여 곳에 매주 영어, 일본어, 한국어로 발송을 하고 있습니다. Uh, North Korean NTDB for the past two years, uh, these are with people, the defectors that have said yes, uh, said yes to our request to uh, make their information uh, made public. Uh, we collected their information, both the, the victims and the perpetrators, and uh, once every two weeks we send out the report, a North Korean, it's called the North Korean Human Rights Report, and we send this out to a list that's almost over 2,000 uh, people in this list, and these are uh, members of NGOs such as Amnesty, Amnesty International, uh, governments such as uh, members of the State Department, and other uh, members in this list, and we send out uh, this regular report uh, to the people. This is our support of the NKDB homepage. All the details are the website, so everyone can see it. And this uh, project uh, is uh, through the support of the U.S. Uh, Department of State. And on our NKDB website, our report, uh, all the information, you can view it uh, when you access the website, NKDB website. And then we have a list of the victims and the perpetrators. And we are right now uh, preparing to make the list of the victims and perpetrators. Uh, we are working on organizing this list and to make this available on the website as well. 여러분들이 명함을 저에게 주시면 사건 리포트 발송 리스트에 제가 올려서 모두 받을 수 있도록 하겠습니다. And if you uh, give me your business card, name cards, then I will make sure that you receive this uh, email uh, news report uh, update uh, from NKDB. 저희들이 지금 4만 3천 건의 사건을 데이터베이스를 만들고 있는데 이것을 더 계속 추적하기에는 많은 펀드가 필요하지만 현재 저희들이 12명의 연구원 일을 하고 있는데 전체 인터뷰의 30%는 아까 이제 설명이 나왔지만 분석하지 못하고 서랍에 쌓여 있습니다. And we have so far uh, in our uh, database 43,000 cases that we've uh, collected and we have 12 uh, researchers at NKDB that are working on this but as I mentioned before about 30% of these cases uh, uh, just sit in the file because we just do not have the resources uh, to get to these um, untouched uh, cases. So we need uh, more funding, more resources to help us, to allow us to uh, reach these uh, cases. 앞으로 어려움이 있지만 이 작업을 계속해서 여러분들에게 충분하게 볼수 있는 영어와 일본어와 외국어로 발간해서 볼수 있도록 하겠습니다. And uh, though it may be uh, difficult, uh, we will continue to work on this so that we can have this information available both uh, in, in English, Japanese, and Korean. 그리고 방금 질문하셨듯이 저희들이 가진 2만 3천 명의 인적 정보 중에 대부분은 
피해자이지만 그 중에 수백 명은 가해자가 포함이 돼 있습니다. And to refer to your question, uh, the 23,000 uh, cases, the defectors, uh, there are, most of them are uh, victims, but we do have uh, some uh, who are the perpetrators of the human rights violations. We have to do a lot of research on the human rights violations, but most of the human rights violations are the victims who are the victims. And uh, we make sure that we uh, try to find out who the perpetrators are, but um, it's uh, in most instances it's uh, we don't know who uh, the perpetrators are uh, when we interview, when we uh, work on these uh, interviews and do these uh, cases. 저희들이 확인한 가해자는 앞에서 이야기한 북한 인권 사건 리포트에 정확하게 그 사람 이름과 직책과 주소까지 포함을 해서 전 세계에 발송을 하는데 이것은. 세계 나와 있는 북한 대사관에도 보내기 때문에 북한 당국도 이 사실을 알고 있습니다. And regarding the uh, confirmed uh, perpetrators uh, that uh, that we know through our research and these are included in the reports that we sent out. We have their names, uh, their former titles, even their addresses uh, in North Korea. And this list we actually send out to the North Korean uh, missions across the world uh, as well. So they, uh, the government itself, knows about uh, the list that we've. Uh, so far. 그리고 저희들이 북한으로 보내는 라디오 방송을 통해서 이 가해자의 이름과 사건의 내용 그리고 뒤에 처벌될 수 있다고 하는 내용을 북쪽으로 방송을 통해서 계속 보내고 있기 때문에 북한의 이 가해자들은 상당히 그, 이것에 대해서 조심하고 경고를 받고 있는 상황입니다. And through our uh, work, we also have a project where we uh, broadcast into North Korea, and we broadcast the contents of uh, the perpetrators, their names, uh, what they did, and uh, we um, uh, send this information via uh, radio broadcast. So the people, uh, the North Korean regime, uh, they are being careful, and they know that um, we have this uh, list of uh, perpetrators, and we know uh, the crimes that they committed. And we make this known uh, through uh, the radio broadcast that we uh, do through our uh, organization. Thank you, Dr. Yoon. Uh, that said, um, we have time for just one final question. Yes, sir, that goes to you. Yes, thank you. Uh, so, my name is Jim Thomason, and I am the director of the Strategy and Risk um, Program at uh, the Institute for Defense Analyses in Virginia. And my question con uh, concerns the, uh, uh, the best case that might, that might transpire um, based upon your excellent work, your efforts with, um, uh, uh, with the commission, um, say five years from now. Uh, this is a question to any of you. Um, my, I have to say that my own concern is actually that um, the way things are going um, in North Korea, um, the situation is going to get worse and worse and worse from the standpoint of the possibility of conflict. Um, if DPRK gets um, even larger nuclear capabilities, um, then that increases the odds of miscalculation, increases the odds of conflict, increases the odds of things going very badly. Um, in my own, from my own perspective, the very most key player, as Mr. Napsios or Ambassador Napsios said earlier, um, in trying to improve the situation is China, negotiating something with China. Your excellent work in terms of human rights violations is a very important dimension of this problem, but i curious, what is your assessment of sort of the best case that could emerge um, five years from now? Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. If I may, just because this work is so difficult and we have no access inside the country, it doesn't mean that we have to cease our efforts to continue to document and write about the North Korean human rights violations and inform public opinion and the world on these very important issues. Ideally, uh, the North Korean regime would realize that there is a worthy precedent that of Burma that freed hundreds of political prisoners in late 2011, early 2012, 
uh, Nobel Prize laureate, uh, Madame Aung San Suu Kyi, is a member of the parliament now. Yes, the parliament is still 80% controlled by the Burmese military. Positive steps have been taken. The, the international response was overwhelmingly positive, culminating in the, the visit uh, by President Barack Obama as part of his first uh, post-re-election um, overseas visit. So there's a worthy precedent they can learn from. Ideal case scenario, Kim Jong-un and the entire leadership of North Korea surrender to the Committee for Human Rights in North Korea. <laughs> 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 Gentlemen, any other comments? If that's the best case scenario, um, <laughs> the worst case scenario, we can all figure it out. But maybe a realistic case scenario five years from now is having this conversation again. Uh, I mean, there will be modest, possibly modest improvements, but it will be, you know, maybe a few thousand more defectors who have made it to South Korea. There will be more interviews, but realistically, this is where we are. Let's do it in Beijing next time, right? <laughs> <laughs> Shanghai. I can't, I'm not sure about the, the small. <laughs> Great. Well, thank you. That said, I'd like to thank all of you. Thank you. Very importantly, I'd like to thank our gracious hosts and Dr. Peg um, Bobisov and Lisa Collins for the flawless planning and execution of this conference. We will now take a 10 minute coffee.